Now, not be, I'm not going to say any many of these personal grades, obviously, but but it, I do want to address these midterms. I know it took forever for me to get them back, and part of the technical difficulty that I was suffering like all day today is that it, it's something with Google Classroom where where I was trying to. This is not it, you're not going to. It's not interesting, but basically. Half, half of all my grading kept getting erased because it turns out there's a limit to how many times you can edit on the same document. And I this used to be true and then I thought the problem was solved. So I no longer take into account. Um, but apparently the problem is not fully solved, with it, that, which is to say, I find, uh, and those of you who are teachers or are gonna be teaching in any way, one little trick of teaching is it is better to grade. It's better rather than grading one student at a time with an exam, it's actually, more efficient and more fair to grade one problem at a time, like to do everybody's problem one and then do everybody's problem two. If you think about it, it's like assembly line reasoning. And it is also more fair because you get into a mindset of just grading a particular thing and you don't see names as much and you just churn. So everybody gets more equal point distributions that way. Not that any of you care, I'm just kidding. But it turns out on Google Classroom, there's a limit to how much you can do that because if you keep start editing on the same document, it will not, It'll act like it's saving your edits, but it's not. And I found out that the hard way, in the, like a day or something, I started losing everything that I was doing, uh, and I didn't know why. Anyway, this is my problem, not your, or my fault, not yours. No reason you have to be hearing about this. I apologize, but that so things were crashing, and grades were getting lost, and documents were getting lost right up until into this class. Which, but I know we we'd already lost so much time. Like you need to get them back. So just about all of you have now gotten it back and we're gonna talk about it. I know a couple of you have not gotten it back yet. That is not a punishment to you, but if you haven't gotten it back, it's because either your exam came in later. And again, this is not a pun, and you know, there has to be a consequence of that, but, but this is not a punishment. It's just a reality that if your exam came in later then I didn't put it in the first priority bin, or if for some reason like, your exam came in in a strange format, like if all the pages were separate files, even if it was explained to me why that happened, and I do understand, and just like I'm asking you guys to be understanding of me, I can understand if that happened in a couple of cases, but it does severely slow me down. So I'm just asking for the same understanding in reverse. So if you haven't gotten your exam back yet, it's for some reason like that. It's not that you're being punished for that, but it's that that's why you're once everything became a panic, that's why your exam, whoever you are, went into a different pile. So everybody will get them back no matter where or how they submitted them. And I do apologize, again, asking for your patience, but since most of you now have gotten them back, I believe, or at least have gotten a number, let me first tell you, uh, Laura, let me, well, I mean, I think they were very good on the whole, but I also, also hate saying, making generalized remarks because every exam was different and not every grade was perfect. So let me first ask all of you, because there was a technical problem, that is to say, I lost a lot of the work I did grading them in the middle. That is why many of you got more than one file back. So in the end, the one number that you're getting on the exam should rep, the one number that, so these were I'm gonna ask everybody to check. I mean, check me, you have a right, and in fact, an obligation to do that. Let me explain how the grading worked or whatever. Like the one number that you got, like, you know, the grade that you got is supposed to be out of 100. It's supposed to be a raw score out of 100. Like it's not curved or anything like that. Again, we can talk about that issue of curving in a moment if you'd like, but the actual score that you got on your exam is supposed to be a raw score out of 100. Um, and what it should represent, I mean, and not to be idiotic, but it should represent 100 minus the total number of points that you were deducted on the sum total of all documents that you got back. I wish that were just one document, but in many of your cases, like, you know, I did I problem or part one on one document, and then part two is a different document that you got back. And that's just as annoying to me as it is to you, I assure you. But so that's what I want everybody to check before we go any further, like, please, like look at the documents and see if you lost seven on one document and then you lost, you know, four on the other, then that should mean that together you lost 11 and that should mean that you got an 89. But if you got an 86, like that's the first thing you would want to bring to my attention. Like, uh, especially at the end, I was rushing to rectify things. 
So it is possible that I made errors. And as long as you're polite, it's not only you're right, but it's actually like incumbent on you to politely ask me like in, you know, in private chat right now or something, if you think, if you think there's, and I'm talking right now in terms of just literally adding up the numbers, you should make sure, first of all, that the numbers add up properly. Like even before we get into like why I took off points. And I do mean that, I'd like everybody to check. Um, you, in most cases, you can tell, like wherever I take off a point or two, I put it in a little circle wherever I took it off. I try to give a reason. Occasionally my reason is illegible. We'll get to the reasons in a moment. But what you should find is that wherever I take off points, like I take them off in a little circle. It's usually like one point or two points usually in a little circle. And then what I usually try to do is for every single page, add up all the deductions and then just like right at the bottom right um, hand corner of the page, there should be like a, you know, a corner where there's a total of all the points deducted on that page. Um, and so it should be, and that's for your purpose and mine, like it should be the case that then you could just add up all of, you know, you could just flip one page after another, add up all of the page totals and get the grand total of deductions. It should be easier than it is right now, again, because it should have been all one document. But even there, occasionally I make a mistake. Like if, well, well let, let me back up for a second. I know that that page thing confuses some people sometimes. Like if there's a whole, and usually I'll put a check at, at the bottom right of the page if literally the whole page is just all checks and no point deductions. This whole idea so that I could just flip through and add up all, you, you get it, I think. But that means there's two things that can be confusing to people. Number one, like until you realize that's what I'm doing, you might open to a page and see that I took off one point somewhere on the page. And then you'll see, so you'll see like negative one somewhere on the page, but then you'll also see negative one at the bottom right hand corner of the page. That, I hope it is sort of clear now that what I'm saying is that's not me double counting. That's just, if you lost, you know, the bottom is supposed to be a total of the whole page. So it doesn't mean you, I hope that's clear what I'm saying, but also occasionally, Say, say I took off two over here, like say you lost two points on a small, on an exercise, and then you lost another two points over here. So that should make a total of four, right? Then it should say four at the bottom of the page. But if for some reason I did wrong math and it just says negative three at the bottom of the page, you might be psyched for a minute and you might think, oh, okay, he totally just accidentally gave me an extra point that I don't deserve, but I'm happy to take. Well, that might be, except it might not be because because of this whole two document thing, when I had to go back and recount and recount the points, like if ever there was a conflict, if I noticed that I did wrong math, even though I can't change the document now, like I actually, what I'm trying to say is I might've caught that point when I totaled the whole thing. So, if it looks like a contradiction, if it looks like negative two were taken off and negative two were taken off, but it looks like I only took three out for the whole page, um, I still might have realized that at some point. I, you still might have gotten four for the whole page. So, you know, note that. If it, I am going to ask you again to just check my math and make sure I didn't do the math wrong, because, and this I do mean, if somewhere, I did the math wrong. Like if you have found a total of 13 points that I deducted throughout your whole exam, but then instead of giving you an 87, I marked it as an 85. Like if I literally did the math wrong, definitely you should tell me, definitely that's my bad. And as long as you tell me politely, of course, then I will change the grade. Like this is not Moses. I mean, I mean, you, you know, you're allowed to protest that I did the math wrong, but I will also tell you, if it turns out that I did the math wrong or something and you show me, but I did it in your favor, I will not change it. I'm going to tell you that right now. Like if there's something confusing anywhere in the math of what I did in your exam, you don't worry about taking the risk of bringing it to my attention. Because if once I put in the grades, if we, if you, or, and this is my general policy, is if you ever see me again or whatever, and I hate to protract all this, but I've taken so long with these exams. I think I think everything I want everything to be as clear and fair and, and transparent as it can be. So, like, I don't mind being told. I, I I want there to be room for you to negotiate, especially on something clear like 
a math error on my part. If you bring a math error to my attention, if the error was not in your favor, I will fix it immediately. If actually it turns out the error is in your favor, I will not backtrack and change it. Let me say that again, clearly, like as clearly as I can. If you bring something to my attention in your exam and it turns out somehow or other, I gave you a score that's actually higher than you actually should have earned, but I'm only realizing that because you just brought it to my attention. I am not gonna punish you for honesty or for, or for confusion or for raising it. Like in other words, you can raise your grade by negotiating or by politely questioning. You cannot lower your grade by negotiating. I, will, I don't know how more clearly to say it, but there's a thousand reasons that I believe in that. One of them is I like to know how many mistakes I'm making. So I don't want people, so I want people to show me if I'm making mistakes. If I were totally overly generously grading everybody, I would want to know that for myself for the next semester. But I need to know that so badly that I do not want you to be punished for your honesty. So again, if you have a question about any of the computations I'm doing, you should bring them to my attention. Um, and you and you are not risking, I mean, as long as you're polite, you're not risking anything by bringing them to my attention. Um, also, there's no statute of limitations on this. Like I'm saying all this frantically now because I know we lost a lot of class time and because all this, these issues make me nervous. But like you, if you find something later in your test, I am definitely not saying do or die right now. Like you could bring it to my attention, especially because two of you or some of you have not gotten it back yet anyway. Um, so if you find something next week or something outside of class time, totally, again, please be polite. Please, uh, I, I, you know, but you can text me and say, you know, and screenshot or whatever. Or if it's like really complicated, text me and say, can we talk for five minutes on the phone? I, there's something confusing in my exam. You're totally encouraged and allowed to do that. As long as you know that I, I don't think that I don't make mistakes. So as long as we both hand, and by the way, I also want all your grades to be high. We're not against each other in this. So as long as you're polite, you're allowed, you're very much allowed to raise issues about your grade and you don't have to panic and think that that opportunity will be lost. Honestly, you could even raise a question about this midterm right up until the final. Like once there's a final, then we have to worry about that. But okay, so you could take your time looking through it. And that's another thing is if we're gonna spend this much time having an exam and taking it, it should be a learning experience. So don't just like throw away the thing right now. Um, okay. So, so first you should all check, and I'm not even looking at the chat. You know, it doesn't look like there's anything. First, you should just make sure that the way I took off the numbers works out right and that you understand it. But then as far as why I took off points anywhere, that is something I, I want to spend a little, like I, um, I kind of do want to go through certain aspects of this exam and explain why. Um, I may do some of that this period. I may do more of it next period. I mean, part of what I want to go through is, is think, my main concern is to highlight places where I took of points in your exam that could possibly in any way um, re-emerge on your final exam. Like definitely anywhere here where people lost points, especially if it was like for not understanding my instructions the way I understand them or something like that. We definitely, you know, that, that happens, that did happen, that can happen. That's the kind of thing that, um, uh, it would be a waste if we didn't um, rediscuss that before your final exam. Like there's no reason for that to happen twice. I won't get to all of those kind of issues today. In fact, in fact, I don't think I want to get to most of them today. I would like you to have a chance to take the exam home, you know, and look at it in the week between now and next week, but we will, and I want everybody to have gotten back, but I will walk through parts of this exam and say where like a lot of people lost points and stuff like that. Um, uh, what else do I want to say? Um, 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 oh. Like, yes, right at the beginning, some people lost two points right at the beginning for not making the question utterly explicit to me. Now I'm very picky about this, very picky, uh, maybe too picky, but let me just, on the other, I don't think anybody lost more than two points for this issue on the whole exam. And again, I think people did well, um, um, but it will be the same thing on your final exam. Like you're gonna, on your final exam, again, it's gonna be take home. 
It's going to be use whatever resources you want. It's going to be a situation where we try to help you practice it even before you get it. There won't be as much time. Um, for the, but oh, and to be more clear, because this was asked in the other class, like when I say the final exam is going to run just like this one ran, I really mean it. I don't know. I mean, we are running out of time in the whole semester. But what I really mean is the final exam will be posted during, at the end of the last week of classes. Like, so it will be posted in that last week of classes. You will have already gotten a practice exam and talked about it with Walters. Um, again, you won't have as much time with it, but you will have gotten a practice exam. You will have talked about it with Walters. The actual final exam will be posted toward the end of the last week of classes and you'll have the whole final exam period to do it. That is, it'll be due back at the end of the last day of final exam, which I think is a Thursday. I have to check on that. So I, you know, I'm saying this all as a concept right now. Obviously, again, I apologize. I'm a little bit frenetic, but so I don't have the exact numbers right in front of me, but you can rest assured that, you know, whatever it says in your John Jay final exam schedule, it says, oh, wait, someone's here. Even if it says something like, um, you know, that this class meets on so-and-so a day for the final exam, that's not, whatever day during the final exam that we're supposed to meet, we're, we won't, we're not. You're fine, and that will not be the day that your final exam is due. Your final exam will be due essentially the end of the final exam period. You will essentially have the full final exam period to do it at home as though it were, you know, a poli sci uh, like paper or something like that. Um, and the grading standards will be the same as here. Like I will be super picky about, you know, since you will do it that way, I will want a document that I can look at in its own right and know what the question is that is being answered at every stage of the game. Like I want the question to be explicitly presented to me before I even start looking at the work. I want it explicitly presented, but not cut and paste from my particular words. That's a, that's a super picky thing, I know. I mean, I think that's about one of my more picky things. Um, uh, but it is a really important research skill. Um, to, to be able to lead with the headline and not, not bury the lead. Um, and it also makes the grading less inefficient. Um, so if you lost two points right at the beginning of this exam because I wrote like, what is the question? You might even have given me an answer that even does, like you might even have been good enough to say in your very first answer, like circumference equals um, four pi feet or something like that. Or you might even have been and which a lot of people did, you might say C equals four pi, I don't, I don't remember what, oh, sorry, uh, 20 pi, yeah. Like the very first answer of the very first question on the whole exam is, is 20 pi feet, but that, but what, 20 pi feet equals, well, you could say it equals C or you could say it equals circumference and many of you did, but I mean, the actual question is asking like, how long would a string need to be to go around the entire thing? So, I mean, even if you say 20 pi feet equals circumference, like that's a little bit vague because the question explicitly does is, at it, I mean, that doesn't tell me what the question is. The question is how many, um, I mean, what length of a string would you need to go around this entire thing? And then yes, you're using the fact that you know that that means circumference and you're solving for circumference, but like, you know that, in your head, but that, but you still have to bring it back to what the actual question is. Um, and, and it's nice for me to know what the question is before you start. I shouldn't have to infer the question from your final answer. Again, very, very picky. Hopefully it didn't amount to more than two points in many cases, in some cases, one point, depending on how explicit you were. But yeah, that's a kind of thing, please on the final exam, make it super clear what the question is before you even begin the work. Um, um, I, uh, how much more do I wanna say about this? Um, I think there is a point in the exam, like by the time it gets, all right, let me just take a breath for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there are more details I want to say about the exam, but I think I'm going to wait till next time to say them uh, for a variety of reasons. I will say them, but uh, in, so if, so, you know, anywhere, if you lost points, but you're not entirely sure why, maybe, 
in a certain place. That might be best weighted for next week. Again, you still have the opportunity to argue the points. And I often do give points back at, you know, in a polite argument or discussion. Um, but if all the points add up correctly and you're just not entirely sure why you lost points in a certain place, I think we might be able to discuss that better in the next week or let it sink in first before we do. Um, um, it is true that the answer to all the sine and cosine questions, like when you get like one, zero, negative one, negative, you know, those answers, those are not in radians. Just to clarify to everybody, like the cosine of, of pi, the cosine of, of 60 degrees is not one half radian. It's one half. That's kind of important. I mean, um, and I didn't, I, so if you wrote radians after all those answers, I probably did take off two points or something, but once, I mean, I'm not repeatedly taking off those points over and over, but you know, a lot of this exam really is trying to help us all understand what a radian is. And so I kind of do feel the right to be picky about that. Um, similarly, the question, the question right after the pizza pie question, the question where it says, all right, look at your answers above, like if you, particularly look at your answers where the unit circle, where the radius um, for the circle was given as one, uh, when the radius was given as, like first the radius is given as 10, right? Then the radius is given as something else. And then eventually it says, what if the radius were actually one? And it goes through and asks you, okay, how much string would it take to go around the whole thing? How much string would it take to go around half the thing, blah, blah, blah. But what I want you to understand is all those answers that you're giving there, how much string would it take to go around a full? How much string would it need to go around a half? The part of the pattern that we're trying to have you see is that once we say the radius is one, then every answer that you're getting there for arc lengths, like, like what's the arc length around a whole circle and you're saying two pi or whatever, and then what's the arc length that you're getting for a half a circle and you get pi, right? Well, the the arc length is, you know, two pi or pi or whatever times r. If r is one, then the arc lengths you're getting are literally the angle measurements measured in radians. Like, we're trying to say this as many different ways as we can, sort of both before the test and through the test, but, but what an angle is, what an angle is, is arc length per radius. What an angle is, is the ratio of arc length that you cut out divided by the radius of that circle. So if the radius of that circle is one, then angle is arc length. If you say that you, if you go to like, so, so the answer to that question, what are we really measuring here? We're really measuring angles in radians. Once we're, whenever, when we're at, it, when we're asking for arc lengths, but we're asking for them in a circle whose radius is one, that's literally what an angle is. What an angle measured in radians is, is how much arc length do you get per radius? And if your radius is one, then it's, you're literally just asking how much arc length do you get? I don't, that, I, I mean, I can't say it any better. I probably can't say it better than that, but so the answer to the, what are we really measuring here? The answer is angles. And in what units? In radians. Um, an angle is just an arc length per radial distance. I don't know if that helps at all. But similarly, by the way, another thing that I think a lot of people sort of got wrong or misguided on is um, this whole, oh yeah, and this is worth talking about. All right, wait, I'm gonna, again. And I don't mean to sound critical right here. I think the numbers were good for the most part. I know that some people might be disappointed or thrown by their numbers. And again, I'll either talk to those people in private or we all will have some opportunity for like a, I mean, we're running out of time in the semester, but okay, no, actually I'm gonna pause here. Let me just remind you how the grading works also. Okay, if you're worried, if you're not worried about your grade right now, good, like great and congratulations. And if you are worried about your grade right now that I'm addressing you, again, I'm not here to chastise anybody or tell anybody that they should be worried. I just, I know some of the numbers were not exactly what some of you might've expected. So let me put that in perspective for a second. And I, and I don't offhand know the mean, I'll get back to you with the mean and the, and the uh, standard deviation, like once I have all of them in, but, but let me just remind you how grading works in the whole course so that, so that none of you thinks 
suddenly that all hope is lost or that everything is a disaster or something like that, because you shouldn't. Because again, any of you who's sitting here right now, I mean, I know you all fairly well. I know you've been here. I know people are trying and stuff like that. So let me just brief overview of how the grades work. Um, uh, first of all, everything you do in lab, um, um, everything you do for Walters all adds up, you know, to one final grade in lab and that whatever you ultimately get as the average of all your grades for Walters, that already amounts to, I believe, oh, now I'm gonna, I don't wanna get this wrong. I will get, it's in the syllabus, you can check the syllabus and I can confirm with Walters, but I believe everything that you get that you do with Walters because it's such a huge component of the course. I believe that's 40% of your grade right there. Maybe it's third, it could be a third, but I think it's 40%. And again, check that in the syllabus or check that with Walters. So first of all, like anything you do with me, if you add up and do everything that you do with me, including the final exam, that's like uh, either 60 or 67% of your grade. Now, how do you get a grade from me? You have this midterm, you have the final exam, assuming you get no more points or nothing or anything like that on the midterm, you, the, the midterm and the final exam are averaged together to make one exam average. But then all of the points that you're getting for all of the homeworks, any regular homeworks we've ever done, but particularly all the game assignments, remember all of those points that you accumulate with every game assignment that you turn in, which you still can turn them in, or any old homeworks that you can still turn in if you haven't yet, all the points that you get in all the homeworks all add up to a big pile of points. And then we divide that pile by some scaling factor, which is the same scaling factor for all the students in the class, but differs from semester to semester. And all of those homeworks, you, points that you've accumulated, once they're divided by a scaling factor, all amount to some pile of points that you have at the end that on average, typically, for in a typical semester for typical students, you'll end up getting something like 12 points for all the homework that you did. Oh, someone's here, sorry, sorry. You'll have, on average, like the typical person in this room will have something like, and I will shut up in a second and I'll check the chat, I'm sorry. You'll have something like, on average, 12 extra points that came from all of your homework that you did. And those 12 points are added directly to your exam average, okay, um, before we do anything else. And then everything you do, do in lab is, is weighted 40% or 33%, whatever it is that it says in the syllabus. Um, so in other words, even before your lab gets added into your grade, your, your exam average in lecture gets boosted by typically 12 points, which is, you know, more than a full grade, right? Like if you had an average of 78 between your midterm exam and your final exam, and then you got 12 points of homework, that means you already have an A minus just from lecture alone, and then your lab is averaged in. So please do understand, in other words, the homework makes a huge difference. And most of our homeworks have just been these game homeworks where you're getting 50 points, you know, just for, for writing a sentence. So please do understand, and that, and honestly, to answer any questions that might arise now, that is how technically we curve the grades. We don't actually curb the individual exam grades. We curve, if you want to call it that, the entire grade by using the homework points as a lever for doing so. This is why I can't tell you right now what the scaling factor is for all your homework points. We determine that scaling factor at the end of every semester. We come up with one scaling factor that's the same for all students. But the way we come up with that scaling factor is we come up with a number that guarantees that people will get A's. I mean, to be, I mean, if they wouldn't have already anyway. Uh, in other words, that's how we curve. We, 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 we multiply all your homework points by an amount that ensures that, you know, that ensures that whoever got the highest grade in class is definitely getting an A to, to put it mildly. Um, so we curve the whole thing but through homework points. Why do we do it that way? Well, partly because we think homework is really important. Um, uh, and two, because actually technically, even though you would never know this from the way to, technically in the science department, we're not allowed to curve. I mean, I don't even know why. I'm not even saying I agree with that policy, but, but technically we're not actually. So that's why a lot of times in a lot of classes you get 
a lot of extra credit opportunities and stuff like that. Well, all of our homeworks are extra credits because you don't have to do them and you're not graded on a percent. You're just getting points to add to your average. But so all of the extra credits are our mechanism for curving the whole thing um, in that way. I don't know if that helps anybody. But again, if you did really, really abysmally on this exam or something like that, or you're really concerned, I will definitely, we'll talk in private, we'll see what's what. There will be opportunities for rectification for the whole class. Like we'll do some kind of, I, um, I, we won't do literal test corrections because it's gonna take too long, but we'll do something for the whole class to get some extra credit points back on this thing. I just have to think of how, um, and we'll talk more about it next week. Um, but that's the overall, but nobody should be panicked. Um, that's the overall sum of this situation. Uh, what else? Um, um, there's uh, there's one other big thing I want to say about pi, um, and like why pi is precise and three point one four is not precise. And I think a lot of you have that backwards in your mind. I do want to talk about that, but I'm going to pause before I do because that, if I do it right, will be more fun and interesting and will seem less punitive. Uh, so I wanna take my, a breath before I do that. It may be today, maybe next time, but but yeah, some of you may be grumbly or discouraged or, or confused because in the test, you know, we asked like a couple of times, like how many percent, what, what's the, we asked like, how many times precisely must you go around the circle in order to da 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 da? And many of you, when you saw the word precise, you wrote down a lot of digits after the decimal, like you wrote things like 3.14 or 6.28 or something. And then when we asked for it to be approximate, then you used the symbol pi. I think that might be a legitimate, honest confusion in your part, but I do want to straighten it out. Like writing the symbol pi is being precise, but it's not any, but it's not being measurable. Like pi is what you write down in a math context or a math class because it literally is exactly pi, but you'll never see the symbol pi on a ruler. You'll never, uh, and you can never exactly measure a string to pi, to a length of pi centimeters or two pi centimeters or anything. You can only measure a string to something like 3.1 or 3.14 or 3.16 or whatever number of significant digits your ruler goes to. Your ruler will never go to enough significant digits to actually capture pi. You can only go to the number of significant digits that is specified by your ruler or by the situation. And in the situation of the exam, we were asking how many whole strings would it take to go around at some point in the exam. And so we literally asked, I mean, if you look, it says like how many whole strings, no pieces, no fractions of strings. So even one, you know, 1.57 is accurate to two significant digits, but if you're only allowed to use one, then you have to say something like 1.6. But if someone says you're only allowed to go to whole numbers, which is actually a reasonable restriction in something like strings, if you're only allowed to have whole strings, then you have to go to a whole number. Like even there, like I know 1.5 sounds reasonable or two sounds unreasonably approximate, but it reasonability threshold is exactly what the whole significant digit idea is all about. Again, I'm just talking spastically here, but like the, you know, when you got pi over two as an answer to one of these questions in the exam, that's pi over two is the correct answer when we're asking for precise. But then when we ask how many strings would it take, if you got to go to the nearest string, the only thing you can actually say is two strings or one string. I mean, that, but all of this, I know a lot of it is very, very picky. Um, and I hate being picky, but I also sort of think it's kind of fair to be picky on an exam of this nature. Um, you really want to make things as clear and as easy to follow and as well presented as you possibly can, especially if you know that I know that, you know, that it was take home and all of that, like, please make everything super explicit and presented. But okay, that's enough. We'll talk more about that on Monday. I think, again, any private issues at all, please feel free to text me. I'm not trying to close the door on them. I may have made a mistake or I might be being over picky in some cases. I don't mind giving points back when I'm wrong or even if it's a even if it's a uh, on the borderline, I still rather say that the tie goes to the runner, so to speak. Um, but but I know this is all like a, a horrible mood changer too. So I'm gonna say any issues you actually have, like just let them sit for a little bit, let yourself breathe with it for a bit. And then like over the next couple of days, private text me, I mean, text me, 
and or wait till next Monday and we will visit it more formally than that. All right, I mean, that, okay, um, that's a, I know. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna shut up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift gears. I'm gonna look at the chat and then we're gonna just totally talk about physics in a whole different way for a while. Um, let me look at the chat. But I am sorry, I know it all sounds, I'm not unhappy if you're not. I'm just worried that some people might be. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm looking at the chat water collagen, but yes, the final, I don't know if I, hopefully I answer this, the final exam will be identical structure to this. The only issue, the well, I should say identical, but yes, similar. It will be similar in that you'll know what's on it before you get it. You'll be able to take it home. You'll be able to talk to each other. And for all those reasons, we'll really want you, I mean, those of you, and you know who you are, like some of you really put effort into like you did a draft and then you're fine. And clearly what you gave us was like a final draft. You kind of want to do that attitude on your final. It will be just like this. Yes. And, you know, if we ask for diagrams and stuff, or if we ask for you to show your work, don't, and I'm not saying, I don't mean to, but don't just like give us like a side margin of sort of scrap paper versions of your kind of thoughts that like, it's not just that we want to see that you did scratch out your work like that. At, for an exam like this, yeah, use scrap paper and do out your work on scrap paper, but then actually copy it over and make your work like, you know, your work should actually be followable and should be a derivation or a justification or support or explanation of your answers. It's not just to prove that you did do work or something, it's to actually prove the work. So I would highly recommend, please do like a rough draft and then a final for your final. But yes, to answer your question, yes, um, it will be so. Okay, now what needs to? Oh, 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 sorry. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, you do, okay. Oh, so there are some good questions in the private chat. I, I um, Okay, but if you do get, okay. So I'll, but it says that you, okay. Okay, but yeah, but that's a good reminder. There's one private chat reminder. And again, I'm sorry, I know I sound, I'm a little bit jittery too because it, it really did throw me off. Not your exams did not throw me off, but the whole technical side threw me off. And I'm sorry I've taken so long with them. Um, and I'm sorry to be talking about it so much. So I will shift gears, but but there actually is a question in the private chat, a, a good one about the, the game assignments. Don't forget that, yeah, there are like, yes, every week we still have these game assignments where you're just, you know, showing your accountability to the class. And again, it's not too late to retro some of those. If you are honest and authentic about it, you could go back and watch videos or look at past notes to remind yourself. Um, it's not too late. But someone in the private chat did just remind me, there's a couple of like special game assignments, like, you know, that are worth more points and are technically due May 17th or whenever this whole thing ends, which, wow, which is very soon, yeah. Um, don't forget about those. They're still optional. You don't have to do them at all. But, but you know, like one of them or two of them is like, you know, if you've ever, if you've ever actually submitted a, um, if you've ever submitted an image at all, like a screenshot of your work to the chat, you totally should get points for that. And it's not too late to submit those. Um, there's one if you've ever actually had the guts to be like right or wrong, which which you guys do all the time. I mean, definitely notice that there's one called like for right or for wrong. That's for any time you've actually tried to answer a question in front of your colleague. And you guys in this room, you do it all the time. So definitely you should get points for that. Um, but then there's also one that it says your best submit here. Now, okay, so that's that's kind of relevant too, especially if you, like that can be anything. If you think, so the one that's called like your best, if you, on the one end, if you're worried about how you did on this exam, if you think you did badly, and, and I am not, well, anyway, if you think you did badly or you don't like your number, you might want to go back to any homework that you, early homework that you did, you think really well, or any one day of that where you really think you rock the discussion and you have like any documentation to support that, or even, even if you take really good notes, right? If you've been really taking notes in class stuff and you know, I've never been able to see that fact, but you know that it's true, that are especially you don't talk a lot, but you really are taking the class seriously and you're taking all these notes in your own handwriting. Like, I don't know. Okay, yeah, like I see what's in the chat. Fair point. I'll address that in a second. But like, but 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 some of you take really good notes. 
And that's like really good and important. And in some ways, you know, whether it would be a regular class or a Zoom class, in some ways, sure, the professor would never know that, but, but, but why not? I mean, if you are worried about this exam, but you take really good notes, like take a particular day where you took particular good notes and put them together nicely and submit them in that, in that thing that says your best. I mean, you don't have to, again, but there are sides of you people and there's sides of your scholarship that, get, that, that, that don't get attention and they deserve attention. And again, I don't care if you don't care, if you're already solid in the class and your grade is fine, but you're okay. But if you're worried, you have every right, I think, and every invitation to show me a piece of you that you feel like has not had a chance to be um, witnessed, right? So, so an example could be if you took really good notes or, and there too, you know, as long as you're honest about things, it, it, it can be retro. Like if there's some unit we did where you really, really understand and we actually didn't have a homework on it or something and you feel like that wasn't covered enough on the midterm, you can like take your notes and recopy them and make them really nice or just like show that you really get something and put it in there. Just, it's almost just like a defense of you to help if you're worried about your grade. And I'm gonna look there first uh, when I go to do the grades at the end, or conversely, if you rock this midterm, put a copy of it in there, like right now, if you rock this midterm, put it in that, that folder that says like your best, I mean, that portal that says your best, because that way, let's say, God forbid, you, you don't do so well on the final. And of course, with the final, you, you know, you, we don't have a class period after the final. So protect yourself. If you rock this midterm, put it in there. And then that, and that's, so once I'm done grading the finals and everything, if I have to rush to get these grades in, I'm going to look, or if anybody's on the borderline or something, I'm going to, I'm going to look in that portal first. If nothing is there, nothing's there. I'm not going to punish anybody. You're not going to get a zero. But, it, you know, if nothing is in that portal, then I just have to, you know, follow my computer algorithms and just hope for the best for your grade. But if you just want to support your case a little bit better or give me an easier go-to to remember really who you are, do that. Like, so put your midterm in that portal if you think you did really well. And that way, if you did worse on the final, I have a reminder there. Um, and, and vice versa. You, you know, if you didn't do well in the midterm, put something up. Anyway, it's all optional, but that's what at least one of those portals is for. Just please don't forget about it. It's to your benefit. Um, now, <laughs> wow. I, oh my God, you guys, are, you, you guys are so good to each other. That is, I don't even know what S, okay, cool, cool. Now, um, one person who on the private chat, they don't feel like they deserve a particular set. If you don't feel like a particular portal applies to you, then no harm, no foul. No one's getting zeros on those. Those are, Everything is extra credit in a way, besides the exams. That's how we do this. Everything, right? And the, and the whole, yeah, I was going to ask that too, actually. I don't know what that is. Um, um, you know, yeah, which is kind of weird, right? Um, but again, I know what, <laughs> yeah, that is awkward. Um, I'm, I always over talk this stuff because frankly, I, if you haven't guessed, like this stuff stresses me out as much as it stresses you out. I mean, it did as a student and it does now. I mean, I, you know, uh, oh. Oh yeah. Wait, that's why, that's how they, so S is a grade better than A plus. That's why they use S in Animal Crossing when they're raiding the houses, I think. Yeah, that, <laughs> she, oh, shock says, um, yeah, I, that's right. Thank you. Um, uh, Huh. Okay. I'm learning something reading this chat, but yeah, I think Walters tried to explain this to me once that S is like something in some country that isn't this country. And that's why they use it in animal. That's when they rate the hat. Not that everybody knows what I'm talking about, but okay. Um, oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, right. Oh, and that's why they do it in animal. Okay. Okay. Um, 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 um. but look, the, 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 I hate, and I've worked at schools that don't have grades at all. I mean, and that has advantages and disadvantages. Um, in fact, I still also on the side work at a school that does not give grades at all, um, but gives like long reports on everything. Now that's complicated in its own way. Like there's no perfect system. But one thing I've learned from that school, one thing that I really believe in, and I hope this comes across is, um, I mean, we have to evaluate you. You can't all get the same grade. You know, your performance should be rewarded. But what I really have come to believe is no matter what, a grade is a single representation of a 
whole complex person in a whole complex semester of complex varying work, right? It's an average in that sense. An average is, a, is one number that is meant to represent a whole list of generally varying numbers, right? But you know from physics, and, and you know that's reality, that we have to reduce every, a whole complex period of ups and downs into one number or one letter at the end. Okay, as a matter of reality, we all do that to one another. But one thing you learn in math and physics, I hope you have seen in math and physics is, even if we all accept the idea of an average, even if we all accept that like, you know, that often a car will go at different speeds, you'll speed up and it'll slow down and it'll speed up and slow down. But then at the end of the day, the total number of, of, of miles that it traveled and the total amount of minutes that it took to travel is its average velocity, right? At the end of the day, it is analytically important and necessary and powerful and accurate to summarize a whole bunch of varying data with one number that represents all that data. But what you learn in physics and math is that's what average means. It means the one number that represents the whole. But how to compute an average, what method we use for arriving at that number absolutely can also vary, right? There's mean average, there's mode average, there's median average. Then once you get serious into physics and math, you find out there's arithmetic mean, there's geometric mean. And you see all these cases where like the average velocity of a car is not the same thing as the average of its velocities. If you remember that from like last semester, Right, and then their standard deviation, good point. Like there, there's a lot of nuances to statistics, right? And in fact, they're super important. That's why everybody has to take statistics to be a scientist, it turns out, and everybody always hates it while they're doing it. But it actually, what it's trying to get at is data is by nature varied. Conclusions are by nature not varied, right? We get a whole bunch of data and then we try to come to some sort of unitary conclusion about it. That's already a kind of specious, risky thing to do. And therefore, for different circumstances, we choose different methods for reducing all the variation or for you know eliminating all the variation and saying this whole thing can be represented by one number. What There's different methods for doing that. No matter what we're doing, whenever we get an average, an average is supposed to be the lie that is equidistant from all truths, if you think about it, right? Like, it, right? If you get an 80 on one test and a 100 on the other, if we say that your average is a 90, what we're saying is you are effectively equivalent to the student who got a 90 on both. But what is that? That is a lie. Like you didn't get, an, it's a huge lie. You didn't get a 90 on either. But the reason we're going to pick the number 90 and reduce you to a 90, even though you never got a 90 in your life in that course, you got an 80 and 100. I mean, just as an example, we pick 90 because what we think is, Yes, even though even though we just janked you out of 10 points because you got 100 in one of the exams and we're calling you a 90, we also just awarded you 10 points that you didn't get on the other. So we're lying, but we're lying in a way that seems equidistant from all truths. Like it seems like a fair, it seems like a fair compromise because as much as we denied from your performance in one day, we also compensated for your performance in the other day. So everybody accepts this lie. It's the lie that is equidistant from all truths, but that's just one way of doing an average. What I really feel at this point, if I'm gonna take this long to explain is, I feel like actually, if we're gonna pick one number to represent a person's entire work for an entire semester, it's just as reasonable to pick, uh, it's, it's just as reasonable to judge people based on the best that they've ever shown, rather than to judge them on the middle that they've ever shown. Like, I don't know why the middle is actually a good representation of you any more than saying, you know, this person's capable of, boom, I saw it. One, like they've had some bad days. They've had some rough times. They had COVID for heaven's sake, or they lived through COVID. But you know, there was at least one day where they showed what they were capable of. And, and that's why if I'm gonna write them a, a recommendation to graduate school or whatever, I'm gonna base it on that day. Look, look what they're capable of. Look what they do when they wanna do something. Look what they do when there aren't adverse conditions. Look how smart this person is. Like, to me, that's how I judge people. I'd rather, you know, like judge you on because, yeah, because I do. So, so basically we just have as many mechanisms in this class as possible for you to show your best, to show your best. And 
just think of all those portals or in all those portals as an opportunity for you to give your best defense of yourself, your best advertisement of yourself, your best presentation of yourself. And that's what I prefer to compute your grades based on. And the reason it also works, so then most people will get good grades, hopefully, but then it all, the flip side is if you can't get a good grade under all those conditions, then I think the right to complain or the right to take it out on anybody but yourself is a lot more limited, if that makes any sense. Like, I think at the end of the day, with all these systems in place, if somehow you end up not prevailing in the course, then the hope and the assumption is that you know that that's between you and you and your own work and your God and whatever, and it's not, and you know, and maybe and maybe you do or don't care, but that's the flip side of it is, is that we're, you get it, is that we're giving you plenty of rope, we hope. So if you end up choosing to use that rope to hang yourself, hopefully that's your choice and you get that that was your choice, but okay, so much on that, I'm sorry. Uh, but hopefully still everybody will do well. Again, just remember the one thing is I do not have a problem with everybody in the room getting an A. I am not here to make sure that I am not here to make sure that somebody doesn't get an A. I'm here to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to get an A. Okay. Let's totally change. Sorry. I know we only now we have like an hour, but I actually do want to do some physics. So I'm going to totally shift gears here. And I'm going to remind you. Okay, I'm going to open the board here. I'm going to oh. <laughs> I don't even, I think I like what Quasi just wrote. I'm not even sure I get, I'm going to assume that I like that. I'm not even sure I totally get that, but I'll take it. I, or I, I'll, I, I'm not, he might still be talking about Animal Crossing. I, it may be a saying. I'm not sure I know that saying, but I'll, okay. But, uh, but cool. I hope. Ooh. Okay. So I am going to open the board here and shift gears, like I said. And, um, Pardon me for a second, just getting the board going here. Go, oh, okay. Um, bear with me for a second. Okay. Oh, chat amongst yourselves for a second. I'm just, I'm just getting up the board. Tell me in a minute the board should come on. Tell me if it doesn't. Oh. Okay, you should see the screen. It should be visible, and you should see. Uh, okay. Um, and I don't know why. Okay. Totally different topic now. Totally different. 
Um, it, it, this is going to sound like it's completely out of nowhere in a way. Um, uh, but it's a continuation of the larger theme of the class, which is unthingy things, right? Um, the major unthingy thing, or the major unthingy. Oh, 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 right. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you. Actually, oh, sorry. Oh, what just happened? What, ah, why is that? Thank you. <sighs> have they have they changed the way chat works now? Because I feel like. Okay, great. Right. No, thank you, Quasi. That's totally, that's what I was hoping. And, and yes, okay. So I want to back my way into what you were doing in lab last week with Ohm's Law. Right. Now, even that, when you started Ohm's Law last week, that may, it may have struck you as like, wait, where did this come from? How are we suddenly, what's electricity got to do with anything? But the key connection, I mean, there's many connections, but one key connection is in more ways than one, electricity is Another example, a big example of unthingy motion, that is to say motion of non-particles, motion from here to there where there is no individual countable identifiable thing going from here to there. Um, now one, the example that you're looking directly at in lab, the direct is electrical current, okay? even. A, so in fact, let me start with that. I mean, I know you're getting the laws and the, the details from Walters, which is great. Um, and presumably if you were looking at Ohm's law, you're looking at electrical current and electrical resistance and what is technically known as electric potential difference, but what is commonly known as voltage, right? Though, and in fact, and stop me if I'm, and I don't wanna um, you know, run over the same ground, but if you're looking at Ohm's law, you're looking at the relationship among those three things, electrical current, electric potential difference, which is known as voltage, and electrical resistance. Now, let me even start by saying, I guess, let me start by telling you Uh-oh, that's not good. This thing's gonna run out, okay. Now, again, I don't wanna step on his toes or you know, run over the same ground, but if, if, if this is a, a horrible rough sketch of, of some simple circuit that has a battery, a resistor, and some current going around some positive electrical current going around through the wires, right? And you're learning that like I equals delta V over R or delta V equals IR or something hopefully familiar to that. Let me just, let's talk about electrical current for a second. Um, electrical current, well, we're supposed to understand it as electrons that are moving around from the say negative pole of a battery back to the positive pole of a battery or, or right, I mean, and again, stop me if already that is not familiar, but I think even from chemistry and other classes, we're supposed to understand electrical current as the motion of charges. In, um, in fact, well, yeah, as the flow of charges uh, from one place to another. And specifically, it's electrons that tend to do the moving because electrons, you know, are either in the outer orbitals of an atom or more likely can get fully ionized from an atom and can be, and have the, have the capability of moving freely on their own through conductive materials, through metal materials, right? Whereas protons are like stuck in the nucleus of atoms. So in generally, when we're picturing electrical current, we're first supposed to be picturing some flow of electrons moving from like a cathode, if you want to say, or some sort of negative, some, some, some area that has a high excess of electrons, and they're moving towards some area that has a deficiency of, of electrons, or perhaps you might say a, a, a high excess of protons, right? That's, and, and again, stop me if that picture is unfamiliar, but that's sort of the first picture that we tend to learn about electrical current. Then, but then 
kind of because of some bad historical accidents and kind of because of the need to keep um, bookkeeping as simple as possible and to reduce the number of negative signs. Um, be, be, historically, you know, the electron is viewed as negatively charged and the proton is viewed as positively charged. And it becomes very inconvenient to picture these negative charges moving, say, in this case, um, uh, uh, counterclockwise around the circuit. So as I think you already know from Walters, what we tend to do is, is just to treat all circuits as though positive charges are moving in the opposite direction. And it does math, math oh, okay, let me, uh, let me see what you're saying in the chat. I just, oh, good, yes, good, yes. You probably did say, yes, good. Resistance is usually constant, in, at least in a device. Yes, that's good. Um, that's awesome. Oh. Um, but, but you tend to think of the charge, the charges are the things that are moving. We tend to want to believe that realistically it's electrons that are moving one way because really the protons are all trapped in the nuclei of atoms. And so we're always sort of being asked to picture what are known as free electrons going around. But then because the negative signs pile up and the, the, they become very annoying in a bookkeeping way, we then start talking about it as though positive charge is moving the other way from plus to minus, right? So we, we can either say that protons are moving around even though we all kind of know that that's not really happening or we can say something a little bit more sophisticated and a little bit more realistic like electron holes, like absences of electrons are moving around in this case clockwise. Right, and that, so that either way, we sort of realize, okay, this is like a model. This isn't strictly exactly true either way. It's just a helpful way of picturing things so that we can get answers correct. But, but I wanna go a step further right now and say, and say either way, like whether you're, yeah, it's fine to say negatives are going this way or positives are going this way, because actually in either case, we're already making an enormous approximation that's worth recognizing before we go any further. So, and, th and that is this. Oh, I'm sorry. So what this says, I'm about to go to the next page. But what this page says is, okay, current is flow. I want to define flow in a mathematical way in a moment. But I, I'm saying first and foremost that in English, current is flow of charge. If we use lowercase q to stand for charge, like as in some electron that's sitting there or some proton that's sitting there, something with charge. If lowercase q stands for amount of charge that's at a particular point in space at a particular point in time. And if I, if capital I is what we're using and I think it is with Walters, if capital I stands for electrical current, then here's a mathematical definition of, of what current really is that I wanna emphasize. Then, Whoa, whoa. Sorry, the board just totally pooped out on me. Hold on. I don't know why that just happened. One second. 
Um, I mean, the board is still there, but it just left Zoom. So, oh. I think it's back. Is it back? Okay. Um, um, what current is, is, is an amount of charge per unit length, right? Like, um, like D, if Q stands for charge, then dQ dx derivative of charge with respect to X. And if X is, 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 is length measurement, is one dimensional space, right? If you picture a charge density, a one dimensional charge density, so, so an amount of charge per unit length, so in other words, a line of charge, a line of charge, right? If you just have just that, a line of charge, like not a dot of charge, but a line of charge. So that's why I'm writing dQ dx rather than just Q. And you picture that line as moving through space at some rate, right? D, dx dt, like first derivative of position with respect to time, right, which is known in physics as velocity, right, instantaneous velocity, specifically. If you picture a line of charge moving along at some velocity, then in fact, that's what we, that's what current is. Current is, is not, so in other words, what current is not, it's not a point of charge with some velocity. If you just have an electron that flies by you in the room, that is a piece of charge and it's a piece of charge with velocity, but that's all it is. It's a particle moving at some rate. And if you just picture a line of charge that may, it might look like a wire, you know, if you, in other words, you picture a wire with a bunch of extra electrons in it, you might think, oh, here, we've got a circuit going here. But no, if it's just a line of charge just sitting there, that's not current either. That's just that, a line of charge sitting there. But if you have a line of charge moving at some velocity, that's what we mean by current. That's what we mean by flow. And it, if and it, what you can and should do in this way of thinking, whether you think of it as uh, uh, how fractions work or you think of it as the chain rule, it absolutely is legitimate in this case to, to cancel out the dx's. I mean, I'm writing it this way for a reason. And, and it is absolutely legitimate and instructive to say, therefore, well, to say that what I is by definition is, and maybe Walter's already said this, but is dQ dt. That in other words, what I'm trying to express right now is a couple of, with the time that we have left. The first thing is, I mean, this is the proper, this is the actual mathematical definition of current. Current is the first time derivative of charge. It's the rate of charge per unit time. It's, it itself is not a velocity. It itself is not a line. It's a line with velocity. So, so what current really is in English,
Okay, this is illegible as usual, but 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 the, the big distinction I'm trying to make here, or the first distinction I'm trying to make is current can sound like speed. Like when you're measuring current, it sort of sounds like you're measuring like how fast charge is moving, but it's not that. It's you're counting charges going by. So in other words, if you stick an amp meter in a circuit, if you're measuring the number of amps that there is at somewhere in the wire, First of all, it's a measurement that you very specifically and explicitly make at a particular location. Like you pick a spot, a, a point in space, somewhere in the wire, and you stick your ammeter there. And if you're measuring the current there at that point, what you're really asking is, okay, at this particular fixed location in X, how many electrons are rushing by per unit time? Like if 30 rush by in, 30 seconds, it, it, well, it, yeah, if 30 units of charge rush by in 30 seconds, then we would say, aha, I mean, you know, and, and if we assume that's somewhat constant, then we take that to the limit and say, aha, every second on average, one charge is rushing by. So we're, so it's like counting cars going past on a particular spot on the highway. You're not asking how fast the cars are going and you're not asking how many cars in total there are. You're, you're measuring flow, how many per second are going by you, given or assuming a particular spot in space. It is a derivative in that it is measured at a point, as, as opposed to voltage, as opposed to voltage, which is actually truthfully an integral, and voltage is actually measured, is something that's measured between two points, okay, for whatever, if that helps or not, I don't know. Um, this all is, uh, and stop me if this is not making sense, but so so to measure current is to measure flow at a spot. Um, um, now, what is it that's flowing by? This part, I don't know. If, I don't think Walters could have really gotten to, to this. What am I, when I say Q is charge, And generally, whenever we say Q or whenever we say charge, almost always in the, oh, 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 great. Oh my God. Oh, sorry. I'm about to relate this to Coulomb's law. This is, so yes, thank, I don't even know what time that was. Oh, eight minutes ago. Okay, sorry. The Q that I'm talking about here is the same Q that you use in Coulomb's law in chemistry. I'm totally, that's where I'm going with this. Yes, that's good. Um, uh, so it is the same context. Yeah, I mean, it's two different laws. I'm about to try to relate them in a big way. But yes, if you have Coulomb's law, well, let me just ask this. Oh, oh yeah, okay, cool. So yes, Coulomb's law is a helpful thing to have on your brain as I say this. Yes. The reason I keep stuttering is because it's not the same. It's just, it's related, but yes, right, okay. So Q stands for charge. Um, Oh, and one thing I was just about to say is whenever we say charge in this context, nine times out of 10, what we really mean is net charge. We mean extra charge, like, because everything has, right? I mean, every, well, we'll see what I mean in it, but all right. But Q stands for charge. Um, The first place where this does relate to Coulomb's law is absolutely the unit of charge that we're talking about here is the Coulomb. Um, in fact, in fact, one ampere of current equals, by definition, one Coulomb of charge rushing by per every one second of time. So if so like a moment ago on the prior page, I said I is defined to be dQ dt. So current is a rate of charge per second or per time. Specifically, the unit of current is the ampere and an ampere is defined to be one coulomb of charge rushing by for every one second of time that you wait. Now, what is a coulomb? This is where Coulomb's law comes in. What is a coulomb? Well, well, a coulomb is a unit of charge. Where do we get charge? We get charge from protons and electrons. 
Specifically, realistically, generally we get it for electrons because only electrons are free to move. So to put this in perspective, um, the one lowercase e is a approximately 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And I say approximate, not because I'm not remembering it right, or not because like relying, but because we are chopping off digits when we say this. I mean, it's actually 1.60, it's a transcendental number. But if you're chopping to two significant digits, the amount of charge in an electron is, is so in other words, one electron has negative that number and one, by some strange balance in nature, coincidence of life, or not coincidence, the proton, one proton, has positive 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. One electron has negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Like, the good news is, okay, yes, they have the same magnitude of charge, but notice it's not only an obscure number, it's a tiny number. Like, so in other words, and I'll, I'll go back to that page if you want to copy. Just to put things in perspective, like whenever we talk about an amp of current, we're talking about a coulomb of charge rushing by per every unit second. And a coulomb of charge is an enormous amount of charge if, if you're thinking of charge as coming from electrons, which you should because that's where it does come from. In other words, it takes about 16 quadrillion electrons all packed together in a tiny space to make what we would call one coulomb of charge. This the numbers are all funny like this just because there's a big difference between what exists and what we can measure with our equipment in the lab. Um, like it would be, of course, much more convenient if a coulomb just meant one electron, but that's barely measurable and certainly was not measurable like in, in the days when all of this started getting organized for physicists. So, so a coulomb of charge, whenever I talk about a coulomb of charge rushing around a wire, I might picture extra electron rushing around the wire, but really um, really we should be picturing like 16 quadrillion extra electrons rushing around the wire, just for perspective. Um, I, want to I do want to relate this back to, the goal is to get this back to Coulomb's law. Um, yeah, uh, the last thing we're gonna do today is relate this directly to Coulomb's law. Um, uh, but one thing to say before that.
The one big point I want to make before going on and making another big point, before I actually relate this to Coulomb's law itself um, and relating it to fields, which is where we'll end, I, I just want to talk about this picture of charges rushing around a wire. Like, so yes, everything you're saying with Walters, when you're talking about current, current going through the wire, you're talking about the flow of extra charge through the wire, presumably the flow of extra electrons coming from the negative terminal of a battery moving or a power supply moving toward the positive terminal or power supply uh, uh, to, to the positive terminal of the power supply or battery. And yes, if anybody ever measures an amp of current, they're talking about like 16 billion, uh, 16 quadrillion electrons flowing through a certain space at a certain time. Now, realistically, in the kind of circuits that we normally do in a laboratory or that you're doing in your simulations or whatever, it's, it's also true that we don't usually measure currents as big as one amp. They're usually more like in, in the milliamps, like you'll measure current, like realistic numbers of currents, especially in a laboratory setting, will be like 300 milliamps or something like that. So, okay, so like a third of an amp, but still, you know, that, that's a third of an amp. That's still like a third of 16 quadrillion electrons. So on the one hand, we are asking you to understand like, you know, microscopically a lot is happening when even in a simple circuit, when just a simple amount of current goes through a simple one resistor and through one wire. On the one hand, there's a lot of electrons at play. On the other hand, the truly interesting thing, or I think one of the truly interesting things is that and why this is matters in the class like why we're even studying electricity in this class is when we're studying the flow of these electrons as many not on the one hand there's tons and tons of electrons sitting in the wire doing this thing on the other hand i i really want to emphasize that we're not making any claim at all about any one particular electron not only are we not talking about the speed of a given electron, like when we talk about current, we're talking about flow, right? DQ, DT, not DX, DT of any one Q. But furthermore, there is no electron doing anything like anything that we're saying when we talk about the current. I mean, even to, to put more specific, sorry, someone's here. To put more specifically, if we say current flows from here to there and then keeps doing that and keeps doing that, yes, we're saying net charge flows from here to there. And yes, electrons are the things that carry charge charges. But this is where all of the work that we've done to like drum into our own heads, all the work that we've done to build up waves from simple harmonic oscillation and specifically all the work that we've done to try to picture sound waves in particular sound waves like remember a wave motion from me to you is a motion for which no individual object actually does that motion right like and in the particular case of sound waves we keep saying over and over and i want to emphasize again right here right now when I shout at you guys, something is definitely moving from me to you, from my mouth to your ear. And the, and the stuff that is moving, again, forgetting the internet and all that, but like pretending we were in the same room, if I shout at you, there's definite motion occurring. And the only things that are moving are air molecules, but no individual air molecule makes it from my mouth to your ears. Each individual air molecule oscillates regularly and frequently in its own little zone back and forth, back and forth. And the net effect of all of these staggered, all these phase staggered oscillations is what gives the ultimate um, phenomenon of air molecules rippling in such a way as to send a sound pulse from my mouth to your ears. Like that's how sound works, right? And, and Specifically, the reason I'm reminding us of sound in particular, besides the fact that it's like the most recent thing we did in the class and we talk about it with Doppler effect and all that, specifically, you might recall, we said one day that, that truthfully in the case of sound and also like, well, in the case of sound, much like the case of earthquakes and seismic pulses and seismic vibrations, the pulses are not transverse. 
their compression in the case, right? Like in the case of sound, it's not even that an air molecule goes up and then down, and then another air molecule goes up and then down, and then another, it's not that. It's that the air molecule goes back and forth, and then another air molecule goes back and forth, and then another air molecule goes, so you get these little packets of high pressure, like highly pressurized, highly dense zones of air molecules, like here, and then they open up, and then here, all the air molecules are packed together in a highly dense, highly pressurized, zone, and then they open up, and then here they pack together and open up, right? It's much more like flicking the one edge of a long slinky, like not whipping it up and down, but flicking it goes like that. That's the kind of, so that's called a compression wave or a longitudinal wave, same thing. That's the kind of picture you're supposed to have in your mind with sound. So no individual air molecule ever goes from my mouth to your ear, rather a compression packets, pulse, a compression packets of air pulse from my mouth to your ear. Well, I'm sure you can see where this is going if you're still with me. That's much more, that's what's happening in a wire. Um, there's no electron in it. Like, so people get into this whole dispute or people can get all persnickety like, is it an electron that's going from the negative terminal to the positive? Or is it a proton that's going from the positive terminal to the negative? Oh, I think it's an electron because they're free and the protons are not. Well, I think it's a proton because positive signs are so much easier to deal with it. Well, what I'm actually here to tell you is it's neither. If you want to quibble about that, the much cooler thing to realize is what's actually happening, which is, is that current I'll just, I'll just say. I always run out of space and time right when I have to say the important things. But what I'm saying here, and this now goes back to, this goes back to what Veronica was saying before. I mean, there's a lot of constants that we can rely on in these circuits. One constant that you rely on, like in any loop of any circuit, I maybe this has come up already with Walters, even if you have two devices even if you have two resistors in series or two other kind of devices in series, as long as, and again, I don't want to step out of those or get ahead or behind what he's saying, but in any loop of a circuit, in any one wire of a circuit, no matter which location in the wire you pick, you can, you can believe and verify that the current reading you get will be the same. Like she's right that resistance will be constant throughout a resistor. And also I'm saying current will be constant throughout any one given loop of a circuit. Current does not vary from place to place within a given loop. I mean, if, if, if wires start branching off from a trunk into two separate branches, then things can happen. But within one branch um, of flow, flow is flow. The current reading over here will be the same as a current reading over there. More specifically, I mean, I think this is the way you would put it in the Walters context.
Um, we treat current from here to here to there, whether we put a resistor here or then a battery there or like a TV over there, current we assume stays the same throughout any devices that the current flows through, largely because what current really is, is not a movement of a particular electron, it's a flow of, elect of net charge in general. What really is happening in the wire is like there's a little electron over here and it bangs over, to, bangs into that electron and then bangs back. And then that electron bangs over and bangs back. Most of the electrons, most individual electrons are barely doing anything. They're just kind of drifting around in their own little neighborhood. But what pulses through the wire is, is a pulse, the medium, is the electrons, is the net charge. And what flows through this current is actually like a compression wave. I mean, and it's really hard to picture that unless you've spent like months dealing with waves as you guys have. But, but now that you've spent all this time dealing with waves and realizing that things can move without things moving, so to speak, then you're also in a position to understand why, oh, once you're saying it's a compression wave through a given fixed medium of electrons, then, oh yeah, it kind of stands to reason that the wave will not speed up or slow down. It will remain fixed to a constant speed determined by that medium, just like we were saying about sound. So that's, num that's one thing. So current is a compression wave, in effect, of, of, of net charge. We have, we have seven minutes left, I believe. Yeah, we have seven minutes left, just enough time to say, The charge is moving in the first place because of something that Kat correctly referred to before as Coulomb's law, which is re which you hopefully recognize or have seen written in some way like this um, in chemistry. In fact, I'll make this. And I am aware of the time. I know we have five minutes, so I'm going to say this quickly. If Q stands for charge, just the same way M stands for mass. And if R stands for like displacement, radial displacement, so we, I could have used a D in the denominator. Um, any two given charges we have in the world pull or push each other in, in exactly the same way and with the exact same mathematical um, relation as any two masses pull on each other in the universe. So, and so the bottom equation here, I mean, I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna, well, let's see. Coulomb's law of electrostatic interaction is precisely the same mathematical form as Newton's law of universal gravitation. Any two masses in the universe, any two points of mass will automatically pull on each other, or I should say even better, any one point of mass in the universe will automatically necessarily pull on any other and every other point of mass in the universe with a force measured in Newton's that is bigger, the bigger the two masses are, and, and bigger, the closer the two masses are, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and the distance between them is what we denote with R in the denominator of that fraction. You've heard this before in physics 101. So the closer two masses are, the more they pull on each other, the heavier either two masses are, the more they pull on each other. Same thing with charges. 
with with mass, it's always an attraction, but with charges, it can be an attraction or a repulsion because charge, unlike mass, happens to exist in two different forms, plus and minus, for reasons that nobody knows, or at least I certainly know. Um, what's crazy is that charges automatically pull on each other in this way that depends on distance and size in the exact same fashion as masses pull on each other. I mean, the, the, it's they're both inverse are they're both inverse square laws. Now I know they only have three minutes. I'm not gonna get, we're not gonna do too many details of this right now, but I wanna point out that the way masses pull on each other is the same mathematically as the way charges pull on each other. And this is not a coincidence and this is important. Both of these laws are called fundamental interactions or fundamental forces. And both fundamental forces have this weird inverse R squared relation why? Like, what about them is similar? Why are they both called fundamental? And again, I know I have two minutes, but what's fundamental about these? Like, there's many other forces you've learned in physics. You've learned about the normal force. You've learned about the tension force. You've learned about the friction force. You've learned about the spring force, for sure. Why are these two forces known as fundamental? And why do they both have this weird inverse squared property? The reason they are known as fundamental is that these two are, are the two forces that we know of at this point. These two forces, unlike any other forces you've ever dealt with in physics, these two forces happen, as I keep saying, automatically. What do I mean by automatically? I mean no touching involved. A mass pulls on another. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no problem. Yes, black holes have tons of mass. Black hole, yes, this told this second law totally applies to black holes. Black holes have tons of mass. What they don't have is volume. So they have very, very high densities. But yeah, this totally, so just because I have one minute, I'm just gonna say what's, no, no, yeah, no problem. What I wanna say about the, what's special about these two laws is both of these happen. These two laws are examples of, I'll just write it, of action at, a distance, meaning they happen without touching. Every other force you ever learned about, the way you identify the force is that something touches something else, whether it's friction, tension, spring. These two forces are forces that describe how objects interact through empty space, through empty space. Somehow masses, somehow the sun pulls on the earth without touching the earth. Somehow the earth pulls on my pen without touching the pen. Somehow protons pull on electrons back through wires or whatever without touching the electrons. There could be nothing in between the proton and electron and this thing will happen. Or you could even put a wall in between and they'll still pull. They might not be able to move because of the wall, but gravity and electrostatics operate through a distance, through empty space, which means in short, and this is where we're gonna pick up next time, the sun pulls on the earth with a certain amount somehow, and the amount is, is determined by how far away the earth is. And if the earth gets closer, the sun pulls more, right? You've heard all this more. Well, if that's true and it's happening through empty space, it means that somehow the sun must know how far away the earth is in order to pull on it or a proton must know somehow that an electron is over there at a certain distance and of a certain size if it can pull it without there being anything in between. Somehow information of charges makes it to other charges through empty space. Somehow the information of masses gets to other masses through empty space. That is the ultimate example of unthingy motion because somehow a pull can happen without there being anything there to do the pull. That's what we're gonna get into next time, but that's the, relate, that's the ultimate final reason that we're worrying about all this electricity stuff because in two ways, it's super unthingy. One, electrical current is a flow of charge from here to there where no individual charge is actually moving from here to there at all. And two, yes, this is, this is and two, the idea that this charge is moving to that one because it's being pulled by a certain amount. And the idea that as it gets closer, the amount of the pull will change because the location of the charge has changed, which means that the location, the new location of the charge must be known by the other charge must mean that somehow information of charge number one 
is getting to charge number two through empty space somehow. And yes, that is what we call the electromagnetic field, which is like the last thing of this whole course. So that's it. Yes, good call in the in the chat. Very good call. Um, thank you for being so patient and so indulgent. Thank you for, for giving everything in the world and understanding. And we will talk more about this next week. There's obviously no new homework or anything. Um, and those of you I still owe exams, I'll get them back to. And if you have questions about your exam, please text me. Okay, sorry to keep you. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you. Hi, Professor. Have a good night. You too. You too. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you very much.